All right, so welcome to the summer 2016 edition of the Autonomy Incubator Student Exit Presentations. Javier Puig Navarro, how did I do? Great, excellent. Javier has, uh, he's an old timer. He's been with us three semesters now. Um, in fact, was with us our very first summer when we had just stood up as a team and when we were in our old location. So we've been very fortunate to have Javier come back with us um, every year since then. Um, Javier is a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and um, I just want to talk to you today about time coordinated uh, generation and validation so please welcome Javier. Hi everyone thank you for coming so uh, this is the outline of my talk first I'll give a brief introduction about what I do with time coordination and validation of trajectories uh, and then I will get a little bit more into the detail of time coordination and the proximity queries that we use to make sure that the trajectories are safe to fly. And then I'll briefly go over the Holy Grail mission and how everything interacts and what was our part into the grand scheme of the Holy Grail mission. And then I'll conclude with uh, future work and conclusions. So moving on to the um, introduction, this is, this is, this slide sort of summarizes what our goals for the summer were. So here um, uh, we have the objectives and pro approach and milestones, and it represents sort of the agile uh, method that we use at the autonomy incubator. So out of this slide, I want you to get two important messages. The first one is that we want to generate safe coordinated trajectories, and for that we've identified at least two input methods. The first one is an optimization-based trajectory generation method, where in this case a scientist defines an initial and a final control point, and the trajectory generation algorithm automatically takes care of obstacles, dynamic constraints of the vehicles, and things like that. And the other input method is sort of a geometric pattern where the scientist specifically specifies, okay, I want to fly a helix, a circle, a square, something like that. So one of the things that I would like to highlight is we need those trajectories to be safe. And for that, we need them to be flyable. And by that, I mean they cannot violate the dynamic constraints of the vehicles. And we need them to be feasible. And by that, I mean uh, they have to be deconflicted, either in space or time. So that's the first message, generate coordinated trajectories. And the second message is once you move on to multiple vehicles, you need uh, a robust uh, control law to make sure they all coordinate and achieve consensus on how to uh, execute the mission. So one of the applications of the research that we're doing is the ab initio for the NAS where uh, we are trying to design uh, control architectures that can handle uh, some of the problems that the uh, national airspace is currently having. It's reaching its uh, capability limits, so we would like to increase the density, we would like to uh, improve the optimality of the, tra the trajectories that are being flown, and we also have um, a big problem with the diversity of the aircraft, especially uh, with uh, UAVs and small drones coming into the NAS. So another mission that we can that can benefit from the technologies that we are developing are atmospheric science missions, where um, the scientists will be able to abstract themselves from these low level low level drone operations and focus on the mission. Um, and we estimate that the technologies we're developing uh, will improve accessibility and maneuver maneuverability to places that were uh, not accessible before. It will, the, the use of, of small drones will reduce the cost of the, of the missions and some of the technologies that you've heard from um, Jeremy um, and Lauren um, will make it possible for you non-UAS pilots experts uh, or non-expert UAS pilots to, to fly these kinds of missions. So one of the things that Lauren has touched on is Bessier curves. 
we are using Bezier curves for uh, several reasons, but one of the reasons is that they're, they're very, very intuitive to use, and we can use the VR set to modify those trajectories using, uh, using the control points. And basically, a Bezier curve is nothing else but a polynomial expressed in a sort of a different base that you can see here. So that base consists of the control points, and Bernstein's coefficients, which depend on um, dimensionless parameters, dimensionless parameter zeta that goes from zero to one. And with that, you, you can define the trajectory. Some other interesting properties that we are trying to exploit, exploit from Bezier curves are that they're um, contained in the convex hole of the control point. So here you can see the different control points and how the curve is contained in this convex hole. This is very important in some of the algorithms that will, I will show you later in the presentation. And as I've mentioned, they're very intuitive to modify. So if you drag one control point in a certain direction, the trajectory goes along with it. And in addition, we can impose some sort of intelligent structure to the Bezier curves, so we can um, get some numerical advantages, such as, uh, um, like Lauren has mentioned before, we, we use Pythagorean hodographs because uh, we have a closed form solu solution of the arc length, so we don't need to integrate over uh, the whole curve to compute it. So that's kind of the introduction uh, of what we've done. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about time critical coordination. So when you have multiple um, vehicles that you want uh, and you want to perform a mission with them, uh, you need some sort of communication. So you need a communication network that Jeremy has talked about. And um, among that communication network, the vehicles share some information. Uh, which helps them reach a consensus on how to, how to perform the mission. So this is sort of how the, the network is set up. So uh, these are the coordination states. Uh, basically, it's a number with units of time. You can take it as a virtual time. And by exchanging those coordination sta states, the vehicles can achieve consensus. So we model the network as a graph, a time varying graph, where the vertices are the different vehicles and the edges of the graph are the communication links among them. So I've presented the trajectories and now uh, I won't go over in detail uh, about this point, but there exists a map that transfers these coordination states to the actual position of the drone. So um, that is called the, uh, the, control, the time law, or that we call it the time law, uh, but since it's sort of out of scope of this presentation. So the control objective, now we, we know more or less how the, the system is modeled, and the control objective is to design a distributed control law that guarantees that the vehicles achieve consensus with uh, some sort of uh, tran transient response guarantee. So we want to make sure that the algorithms converge to the desired behavior with a guaranteed convergence rate. So again, this is the control objective. And basically, the physical meaning behind this expression is if this, uh, the coordination states of two vehicles are uh, the same, then they maintain the desired relative position. If the, if the time derivative of the coordination state is equal to one, then the vehicle's traveling, traveling at the desired speed. And here we have the coordination state of one vehicle and the coordination state of a reference agent. So this reference agent is, was defined to impose absolute temporal constraints. And by that, I mean, if you want to get to your destination at 5 p.m., that's an absolute temporal constraint. So if, if this is satisfied, then the vehicle satis, uh, uh, satisfy the end time constraints. Um, so I, as you can see, I, can, uh, I let some margin of error in the relative position, and I let some margin or, of error in the end time constraints. 
and these delta are called, uh, in, in this case, the width of the coordination window, and in this case, the width of the arrival window. So this is the structure, the, the architecture of the, this distributed system. First, we have a reference agent that runs independently of any other agents in the system. So um, you can see it as the clock. This reference agent determines how fast the mission is being performed. And it can be virtual or it can be a real agent. So it can run on the processor, on, on the processors of other agents or it can be a real agent. Then we have the leaders, and as you can see, the leaders listen to the reference agent, but they also leader, listen to the followers. And the leaders know the rate of the mission, because the, re the reference agent is telling them, and they receive information from everyone. And then we have the followers, which do not have knowledge of the mission, but over time, they learn it uh, from the leaders. So, this summer, uh, I was talking to Anna and Danette, and also my advisor back at Illinois, and we realized that the paradigm of time coordination that we had, we have, we had been dealing with was very limited. So before, we only had stringent coordination. And by stringent coordination, I mean if the vehicles need to satisfy a desired relative position, then they you, you don't leave any margin of error. They absolutely need to satisfy that relative position. And we've included this new weak coordination where it's okay to deviate a little bit from the desired relative position of, of the vehicles, which is sort of a more realistic assumption. This is how the national airspace work, works. You allow the vehicles to move around a desired position. So, for stringent coordination, the width of the coordination window is zero, basically. You don't allow any mistakes. And here, it's something greater than zero, and you can define it. It can be two minutes, it can be one minute. And then here, we have the types of end time constraints. So if you want to get your, to your destination simultaneously, multiple vehicles won't need to get there simultaneously, uh, but you don't care when you get there. You have relative temporal constraints. If you need to get to your final destination at a specific moment, say 5 p.m., then you have strict absolute temporal constraints. And then if you need to get to your final destination within a window of arrival, say 5 p.m. plus minus two minutes, then you use loose absolute temporal constraints. So as I've said, uh, this whole block is a completely new development from this summer. And this little, these two green, the, the green blocks were uh, already developed. Uh, we've been working on this block this summer and the, the proof of the stability is almost complete. And we've derived the, the, um, the coordination control law for, for these blocks too. Although the proof, we haven't started the proof yet. So I, since this is relatively new, I always have, um, problems trying to express what the different types of coordinations are. So here's a sort of a spatial representation of what the different end time constraints are. So here we have stringent coordination and relative temporal constraints. And we have a leader and a follower. As I've said before, uh, we need the reference agent to impose absolute temporal constraints. Since we are using relative temporal constraints, the, the reference agent doesn't appear. So as you can see here, the leader and the follower arrive at, at the front end destination at some moment, but simultaneously. If you allow weak coordination, the, then you, lead, you let the vehicles uh, some to, to have some error. So you, they can be slightly discoordinated, but not too much. So there's a bound on how discoordinated they can be. So an example of this is a cooperative road search. For instance, imagine you have two vehicles. One of them has a high resolution camera that is taking pictures of the road for um, surveillance, for instance. And the other one has a lower resolution camera that is using some sort of uh, visual odometry to, for um, GPS denied environments. And they need to overlay. You don't really care when they finish the mission, as long as they are going together, right? 
So this is relative temporal constraints. Now for street absolute temporal constraints, notice that now we have a reference agent. As, as before, we have stringent coordination here. So strict coordination and strict absolute temporal constraints, you leave no margin uh, of error to any of the reference uh, any of the vehicles in the system. So everyone arrives at the desired moment. So 5 p.m., for instance. However, for weak coordination, you can see that the error between leader and follower, uh, leader and reference agent is zero, but the error between the leader and the follower is upper bounded by some value. So an example of time critical coordination with strict absolute temporal constraints is the calibration and validation of satellite instruments. So this is a NASA mission, it's the Ice Bridge mission, and in this case they were flying a satellite and an airplane right below it. Um, and they had to do this because the satellite was measuring the thickness of the ice cap. And as you know, the ice cap moves. So they needed the aircraft to flow, fly right below the satellite. So they were getting accurate data. Then they compared the data of the satellite and the aircraft and um, calibrated the instruments in, in the satellite. So in this case, the reference agent is a physical system. It can be, it's the satellite, right? It runs independently, it's in its orbit, so it cannot coordinate with the other vehicles, and all the vehicles have to uh, sort of follow its lead. And this is sort of a uh, de depiction of the, of the track of the aircraft and the satellite, and all the times. This was flown manually, but with this algorithm we could do, we could do it autonomously. And finally, we, we have loose absolute temporal constraints, which is sort of the more flexible option. So for stringent coordination, you can see that the leader and the follower arrive at the same time, but they can arrive uh, with a banded error with respect to the reference agent. And if, if you have loose absolute temporal constraints and weak coordination, then you allow uh, some error between the reference agent and the leader and some error between the leaders and, and the rest of the agents. So a good example of this is the national airspace. Um, if you want to do an outlanding scenario, what you typically have is a landing strip and an assigned slot. And you should land within th that slot. So this is a simulation that we run. Um, and here you have five UAVs that are tasked to land um, um, at this, at a runway that is aligned with this glide slope. And they should be separated by 30 minutes. And they have a margin of error, 30 seconds, sorry. And they have a margin of error of, of five seconds of something like that. Um, these were very small UAVs, so we could do that. Um, and here you can see sort of how the vehicles are communicating and you can see how they've coordinated and they reach the end of the, of the glide slope uh, in a coordinated manner. So this is the coordination control law that we derived this summer. Um, here I've kept the same color uh, codes as before. So blue refers to the leaders and orange ref refers to the followers. And I've added these two terms with respect to other control laws that we had previously. And basically what this term does is um, it, ensure, it, it defines the type of end time constraints that we have. And this term defines the, the type of coordination that we want. So what is really nice about this control law is that we've been able to capture the whole spectrum of the coordination um, into, a single, into a single law. So moving on to proximity queries, we, know, we now know how to make the vehicles coordinate, um, but how do we make the trajectory safe? And we do that uh, checking distances between trajectories of multiple vehicles, distances between trajectories and obstacles, um, and we've We've been using um, a GJK-based algorithm to uh, check if 
two entities in our uh, flight area collide to check if the two entities are farther away than a specific uh, distance. So this, this is what the tolerance verification algorithm does. It checks if two entities are farther away than a specific distance. Then we have a distance computation algorithm. And finally, we have a penetration distance algorithm. And the function of the penetration distance algorithm is imagine you generate a trajectory and um, it goes through an obstacle. It tells you how to move that trajectory, how to pull the control points of that trajectory so it goes outside the obstacle. And for distance and penetration distance, we can either compute only the distance or the distance and the closest uh, control point, on the closest points. So just as a highlight, um, all these three algorithms need an input that comes from the collision checker. Um, so you should not run the distance algorithm if the two entities collide. And you should not run the penetration distance algorithm if the two entities do not collide. So first comes the collision check, and then you run the distance and the penetration distance. And it, this may seem like you're doing more job that, that you would need to, but you're actually not. The output of the collision uh, algorithm gives a very, very good estimate of on how to start uh, iterating for the distance and the penetration distance. So it, end, it, end, it end up, ends up being more, more efficiently, more efficient. So for each of these, on top of what I've explained, for each of these, you need to compute distances between polytopes and polytopes. Polytopes and Bezier curves, so between obstacles in the field and trajectories and between trajectories and trajectories to make sure that the trajectories of multiple drones do not collide. So what we, what we did this summer is highlighted in green. Um, work in progress is highlighted in yellow and sort of new developments and new algorithms that will hopefully lead to a paper are highlighted in, in red. So I won't go over the, the math for each of the algorithms, but I will show you some simulations. So this is the um, minimum distance algorithm between two polytopes. And what I'm showing you here is basically one of the simulations that I do to check my code. What I do is I get two random obstacles, and I assign some sort of Brownian motion to them. And then I start checking collisions, checking collisions to and that's how I sort of debug my code, because this gives you a lot of uh, different cases. And then I did the same for the distance between a polytope and a trajectory. So here we have an icosahedron that is rotating and translating simultaneously. And as you can see here, we have the, the minimum distance and the two closest points. And at some point, it switches to this end of the curve as it should. And finally, we have here we have two, two Bessier curves, and I'm computing the two minimum distance. One thing that was tricky is you can have multiple uh, local minima in your, in your distance. So what this algorithm is doing right now is just computing the, the first one that it finds, it sticks to it. But we're working on an algorithm that computes mu multiple local minima. So if you go through several obstacles or you have some sort of um, confliction with uh, more than one trajectory, you can modify everything at the same time and pull and modify the curves as you want. So why are the proximity queries important? Well, uh, they ensure the safety distance separation among trajectories and obstacles. They support the distance-based distance risk assessment function that Lauren has presented. And um, we also use them to check the trajectories that we get from the VR headset once they're modified. But uh, we also use them to make sure that the vehicles do not uh, viol or the trajectories do not violate the dynamic constraints of the vehicle. So what you've seen is sort of a small explanation of this part of the code that runs for, for the Holy Grail mission. And here you have uh, the results in the, uh, 
in a flight demonstration. So here, what you see is Megan is introducing all the information uh, to define the trajectories. In this case, it's a flight formation pattern. We get that information into our system, thanks to Jeremy, uh, whose interpreter lets us take all that information and we define the, the trajectories. Once we have the trajectories, Lauren overlays the, the heat map and then we check them with a VR headset. And once we have the leap motion working with a VR headset, then we, uh, we check those working with, what, once we have the leap motion sensor working with the VR headset, we will be able to modify those trajectories. Uh, those trajectories are sent back to the trajectory generation algorithm, which checks those trajectories and validates them. And then we get, once those trajectories are safe to fly, we can, we can run the mission, as you can see here. So uh, to conclude, um, we've defined new types of coordination that uh, I was not even aware they existed before the summer. We've defined a generic coordination algorithm that encompasses all the uh, coordination types that we, at least I could think of. So if you can think of a different coordination type, I'm more than welcome to, to hear. And we've expanded the proximity query algorithms for the CA curves, um, developed tools to define C0, C1, and C2 piecewise by CA curves. And for future work, we'll, uh, pr we'll try to pr prove the stability of the new types of coordination. Uh, we'll continue expanding the proximity query algorithms. And we will try to implement this system sort in the ab initio um, uh, project to analyze phase transition. And an interesting idea is I've shown you these coordination windows. We can play with those um, to tell the vehicles, OK, you can deviate this much from your planned trajectory, depending on the density of traffic and things like that. So I have to thank uh, everyone at the Autonomy Incubator. Once again, it has been a great summer. I really enjoy working with you. I have a fun time. Uh, academically, professionally, and personally. Uh, so thanks to the NET, thanks to Anna for being great mentors, thanks to the great Holy Grail team, Jeremy, Lauren, Megan, Erica, and Angelica, and also the people that helped me get to places, like Steve <laughs> and Ralph. So if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. It. OK, so the question is, can a single mission have multiple types of coordination with it? Yes. The answer is yes, because the distributed control law that you've seen inside in there uh, runs inside of each vehicle. And there's something I haven't explained, uh, but there are some state-dependent link weights that define the type of coordination. So you can target a specific vehicle and say, you're, con you're going to coordinate in this manner, and you're not going. And yeah, yeah, absolutely, you can have. If it had the, ca if it had the cap, what do you mean by if it had the capability to like do if both? If you had a vehicle that was either able to do the straight coordination or the weak coordination, like in what scenario would it be beneficial to do the weak instead of the straight? So I can envision the same scenario running under stringent coordination and weak coordination is just a matter of how you want to constrain your vehicles. If you want to allow some margin of error, then you do weak coordination. If you don't want to allow any margin of error, then you do stringent coordination. Let me give you an example. The national airspace. Um, imagine there are only a few vehicles in the airspace and they're coordinating. Um, since there are only a few vehicles, you can allow for greater errors in your coordination, right? But as the airspace becomes denser and denser, you may want to narrow that coordination window, and it can, it can reach a point where that coordination window is zero, and you're telling the vehicles, okay, stay strictly uh, to the path that we have planned. Do not deviate from it. So I'll, I'll follow on to that question. So thinking closer to today than the ab initio NAS, um, some concepts that we're working on that are part of NextGen, um, which is 
not now gen, next gen, mm -hmm. ab initio, mm -hmm. out in the future. Uh, there's a concept called merging and spacing. So imagine you have in aircraft approaching an airport or terminal area. Um, and they're coming from all these different directions, right? But eventually they're all going to get in the conga line, right? And they're all going to come in. Each aircraft is spacing off the aircraft in front of it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the leader, right? Mm -hmm. There is a leader, yeah. but everything is relative to the aircraft in front of you. One, would your algorithm handle something like this? And if so, would there be more than one leader? How, how do you think you would approach solving that? And then the second question is, how do you think the aircraft would behave if you gave them all a very strict spacing requirement, exactly, versus giving them a little margin where they can um, you know, fly within a window mm -hmm. um, of a time requirement? So, okay. Two questions, actually, but they're related. I'll, I'll start with the last one. How do, th how do the aircraft behave if you have different types of coordination, right? So one thing that is very interesting when you run these simulations is if you do not impose stringent coordination, the vehicle reach consensus much faster. And that's because when you impose stringent coordination, you're asking for a higher control effort. You're asking them, follow this and only this. Um, but when you have a weak coordination, you're letting the vehicles be a little bit lazier. Like if there's a wind gust, you don't need to fight all the wind gusts, you can delay yourself two minutes and that's all right. Um, but what happens when there's a wind gust that strong that you get out of that coordination window? That's a very interesting question because uh, you may have to recompute your trajectories. You, you may not guarantee that those trajectories are safe because they were initially planned for that coordination error. And the first question was... Um, so Building on your answer, yeah. I've got a bunch of these and they're all aligned. Mm -hmm. Would your algorithm solve this as a single leader with many followers, or would it? Could you have multiple leaders where it's relative, right? The, the aircraft in front of you is the leader, and you're following, but you might be the leader for the aircraft behind you. Or mm -hmm. does, it, does it see that as one entity? If you were planning that merging and spacing, so that's a, that's a very interesting question. From some of the work we've done before. Um, we found that there's an optimal ratio of leaders and followers that gives you uh, a maximum guaranteed rate of convergence. And by that I mean there will the, you can ensure that the system will converge to the uh, desired behavior as fast as possible. So that defines the sort of the ratio of leaders and followers. And so you can have multiple leaders and not only that, you can change leaders and followers according to what your interests are. That is something I have not researched, I have not done research into, but I've built a system general enough that allows you to do that. Um, so the answer to the specific outlanding scenario, yes, the, the algorithm should let you, should be able to um, handle those scenarios where you have multiple um, um, vehicles that have to align and uh, reach a glide slope. So yes, the algorithm should be, should be capable of doing such things. Thank you, Javier. Thank you.